I want to talk tonight about making the ordinary extraordinary. We all do ordinary things, don't we? And a lot of life is about ordinariness. But I believe as Christians, when we belong to the Lord and we have the Holy Spirit, he can take what's ordinary and make it extraordinary. So my first question for you is, what is in your hand? What abilities do you have? What giftings do you have? What talents do you have? Now, it's very easy to say I haven't got any, right? But we're going to look at how things that you probably think isn't something that God could use, God can use ordinary things. If we look at Moses, for instance, as an example, we see that for 40 years, 40 years, he shepherded sheep in Midian. His main tool was what? Shepherd's staff. And he used that in a very ordinary way for 40 years. I don't think he had a moment's thought that it was ever going to become extraordinary. But you all know it became extraordinary. Exodus 4 verse 2 says, Then the Lord asked him, What is in your hand? So he didn't give him some words that he would use with Pharaoh. He didn't give him something new. He he used what he already was used to using what was in his hand. Now, some of you will know what that is, what you have that is ordinary without God, but he uses it for something extraordinary. Some of you will know that. In this group, there will be those who don't know yet what it is. And there will be those who do know, but haven't yet seen it used in an extraordinary way. And then there'll be those who are seeing God use it in an extraordinary way. And I want us to look at that. We're going to first of all look at some Bible characters and see the massive variety of what God can use. But then we're going to look at three modern examples of God taking what's ordinary and changing it into extraordinary. And you might be surprised at one of them, at what he uses. We're going to race through some of the Bible characters. Jochebed had straw, some straw, but she wove it into a basket, lined it with tar and pitch, made it as a shelter for her son, Moses. And through that act, not only was Moses preserved, but the whole Israelite nation was preserved through her act of faith in something ordinary, something ordinary, just a basket a waterproof basket. Miriam, all she had was a tambourine. But she, and, and a lot of people diss tambourines, don't they? What a racket, tambourine. You like them, do you, Jean? Well, she had a tambourine, but she used it to lead the whole people of Israel in celebration of God's faithfulness. If you want scriptures for this, that's Exodus 15, 20 to 21. Hannah had a small child. She bore a child. And how many of us have had children and can say they're ordinary? But she gave the child to God and turned what was ordinary into something. He became extraordinary, didn't he? This small child. He became a great prophet, Samuel. Joseph had a dream which became the salvation of his whole family in the famine. Ruth gleaned some stalks of grain and God used them to sustain her family's life and lead her by his providence to marry a man to make her in the lineage of Jesus himself. The little boy, I just love this. I've written this out. I've written the story of the little boy with the five loaves and and two fish from his perspective um, because I can imagine when he got home with these basketfuls of leftovers he'd gone with two loaves I'm digressing but it's just so lovely 
He'd gone with two loaves and five fish. He comes back with baskets of leftovers. And his mum must have said, what on earth have you done today? <laughs> but he gave them to Jesus and, and through that 5,000 were fed. Yeah. The widow, another lovely one. Those of you who did the Bible studies, we studied this one. The widow, all she had was enough food for one more meal for her and her boy. And she took a massive leap of faith in giving it first to the prophet. And through that, they were all fed right through the famine. David had a sling, and the giant Goliath fell when he used it. I believe that was definitely given to God. Definitely given to God. The Israelite nation was saved, and a great king was recognized who led the people, uh, one of the greatest kings in the Bible. Mary of Bethany had a jar of precious ointment. Who thinks your perfume's going to ever be used for God? Yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah. You just don't think, do you, that something like a jar of perfume, and yet she's remembered by people all over the world today for that gift of giving Jesus that perfume. And finally, Dorcas, the seamstress, who when she died, no one would let her go. They begged Peter to bring her back because she had given it in the Lord's work for making clothes for so many widows and others. Wonderful stories in the Bible. What a diverse range of things that were in their hand. But in modern day, there are modern day people who God has used what's in their hand and turned it to something extraordinary. A lady called Alice Todd, this isn't quite modern, but it's near enough, Alice Todd was born on August the 12th, 1842. Her father and two uncles were in the armed forces. At 16 years of age, Alice was converted. In traveling with her parents, she'd seen a lot of military life, of course. And she reali realized that there were some difficulties for the soldiers that she met. A lot of them were drinking too much. Their morals were going downhill. And she was determined to help them. From her own conversion, she knew that the power of God in a man's life was sufficient to lift him from any debts. So she had faith to believe that God could do something. After her father's death, she and her mother moved to Glasgow. And in her spare time, Alice was visiting barracks with tracks and so on, witnessing to the soldiers. But she knew there needed to be something more. She knew that these soldiers needed an alternative place to go than the pub to get drunk. And so she um, talked about it with a lady called Mrs. Allen. Mrs. Allen gave her some money, and she was able to rent some rooms. And she set up what was really very ordinary recreation in these rooms. In one room there was chess. And they had a reading room. They could write letters. There was a quiet room. She served non-alcoholic refreshments. And she made cakes. Now, how many of you like making cakes? And here was a... All right, well, okay. Here was a woman who made cakes. And the soldiers loved her cakes. And they came in. They used the rooms. And from that, that developed and developed and grew. And from that, a mission called the Mission to Military Garrisons was launched. And it's now all over the world. There are homes all over the world. And hundreds and hundreds of soldiers have found Christ through that organization. And Christian soldiers have found refuge from the temptations of a soldier's environment just from one ordinary girl who, re who said, well, I, I can give them somewhere alternative to go and have their recreation instead of the pub. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. So if you can make cakes. So the next one is somebody called Carol Henderson, and you'll recognize some of this. She had a, a legacy left her by her mother, money. Now, I just want you to imagine... Somebody dies and leaves you money. What are you going to do with it? Well, she, she was really concerned 
for people who were in need. She had a, a passion for people who were in need. And so she started a charity to help people in need with food and other things. Can you guess what that became? The Trussell Trust. Yeah. And are now food banks, which are a mainstay of our nation, was born out of that one girl, Carol Henderson, who gave her mum's legacy to set up a charity to help people in need. And I know not all food banks are with the Trussell Trust because it's just grown. So all sorts of folk are doing it. But it, nevertheless, the Trussell Trust have fed so many. Um, in fact, they did a feeding project in Armenia as well. I never knew this, but as well as they're setting it up here, they reached 96,000 people in Armenia with help and care. They supported 80 kindergartens. They had a soup kitchen and an orphanage. So from this little thing that she gave to God, she, get, she could have, you know, she could have decorated her home. She could have added a new bathroom on suite. But she gave that legacy, that precious legacy from her mum to, to make a charity to help people. And from that, we have food banks today. I could tell you a lot more about her, but I'm coming to my favourite. It's an amazing story, and I personally know this guy, and some of you will too. Certainly you will, Chris. A pastor called Peter Cunningham. You know him? Heard of him? Okay, he had a long time concern for people who'd fallen on hard times. He, if you know him, he's such an ordinary guy. In fact, he's a bit of a crackpot, to be honest. Yeah, he's, but he's wonderful. I mean, I, I did a course with him. No, I, no, I shouldn't digress. Anyway, he's, he, is, he is a bit of a nutter, right? But a lovely nutter. And he was really concerned for people who'd fallen on hard times. And so he decided to give up his pension. He was a pastor in Southport. And he decided to give up his pension of £6,000. So he cashed it in. And a lady at his church called Vicky Woodley heard about it. And she said that she wanted to be part of this vision of his to help people in need. So she had a house that had no mortgage. So she put a mortgage on her house and released £20,000, which she also gave. His son, Peter's son, um, wanted a part in it too, but he had nothing. He, he was on a very low salary. He didn't have money, and he had no savings. But he decided in faith to pledge £100 a month. So these three people decided to start something that I can't tell you how it's grown since. What they did was they put down deposits on two two-bedroom flats and they, they allowed people who were homeless to go and live in these flats. After three years, they formed a company called Green Pastures Housing that today, well... They're housing hundreds and hundreds across Britain because it's developed all across Britain. They're located in houses, flats, bedsits from three people who gave what they had in their hand to the Lord. Um, this is, he's had to go to, to government. The government are really impressed with what he's done. And so are many others. I mean, he's just become, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he gets a an MB or something, because he's done so well. And he, he, he says that alcoholics are now free from their addiction, so are drug addicts. Unemployed young people are now working. Mothers who had been brutally beaten are now housed with their children in secure accommodation. People, people with mental health problems are housed and cared for. And most wonderful of all is that many, many have found Christ as saviour. Not through preaching the gospel, but through giving the ordinary and making it extraordinary. Now, we need to notice two things about these people who give the ordinary. There will usually be an initial time of obscurity and hard graft. 
If we look at the life of Moses, we see that the staff was used in the deliverance of Israel after 40 years in obscurity. The widow had struggled through most of the famine before she came to this place where she gave the last bit of oil and meal. David had tended his father's sheep, slain a bear and a lion before he faced Goliath. And Dorcas, we know, had faithfully sown for so many. Alice Todd, the one who set up um, garrisons, military mission garrisons, I can never say it. She'd faithfully visited soldiers, taken tracks, given her time and her, her talents before Mrs. Allen paid for the first home. Carol Henderson had worked alone for years using the money left to her by her mum before the Trussell Trust really took off. And Peter Cunningham actually started with his own caravan. He gave his own caravan, put it in the church car park, and they housed the first homeless people in the caravan in the car park. And then he found that there was a fellowship room in the church that wasn't used very much, and so they turned that into another room to take in. So for, and, the, and he also made them move the cars out the garage of the church and turn that into accommodation before they used the money. So everybody who, I would say everybody who gives something to God for him to use has a time when it's just hard graft and they're obscure, they're not known. They're not, it's after a time that God takes it and uses it. Habakkuk had a vision, you know, and he was waiting for it to be fulfilled. And it says in Habakkuk 2, 3, this vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. We need to know that what we give for God now, we may not see immediately massive results. But if we're faithful and we give and we continue in it, we will see the fulfillment of it. And secondly, there will be times of testing. You know that Ruth was tested when her mother-in-law asked if she wanted to go back to her own people. Mary was tested, wasn't she just, when the disciples criticized the broken jar of perfume, well, at least one of them did, and said it would have been better used to feed the poor. Joseph wasn't half-tested, in prison and captivity until the time for his dream to be fulfilled happened. But there will come a time when if you will give your ordinary, whatever that is, to God, he will make it extraordinary. I want to give you a personal testimony. <clears throat> when I was in uh, my last church, uh, this SSE group that I'm now starting a week on Tuesday, I ran there. And I would say it was, it was my ordinariness, right? I taught different subjects, particularly what the people needed. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. It was good and it was worthwhile. But unbeknownst to me, my file with all my notes for all the different things that I taught, was on our coffee table one, one day. And we had a couple visitors, Eliana and John White, from the International Bible Training College in Sussex. And she idly picked up my file to look through it, see what it was about, and came to one that I'd done on world religions. And she went away. She didn't say anything then, but she contacted me later and said, would I be willing to go and teach at the International Bible Training College? And what had started off as an ordinary venture in my own church ended up with 15 years of the biggest privilege of my life, which was teaching at the Bible College in Sussex. I've just finished this year because it's too far to go from here. But it's been... I can't tell you what it's been like. It's the most wonderful, wonderful faith college. And it's been, when I go there, it's like I'm drinking of what heaven pours out. It's, isn't it wonderful, Dave? It's just wonderful. And, and none of that would have happened. That extraordinary experience would never have happened. 
And then I can give another testimony with Congo. I never intended to go to Congo and do any work in Congo. I just wanted to go and visit where I'd been born. And I went out like a holiday, <laughs> some holiday. I went out with another missionary friend for, uh, I think we went for three weeks the first time. And um, it was horrendous, really horrendous. But out of that, out of going and, and just giving that time to the Lord, doing preaching, we pre I preached in 17 churches during that time. God opened the door for me to build the Bible college that I opened in 2016. Three-story Bible college, £190,000. I've never done a building in my life. You know, and what I'm saying is when we give the little bits, the ordinary, he turns it into something extraordinary. I wish I could transport Peter here tonight, Peter Cunningham, because he could so much better, I mean, you'd laugh your head off, he could so much more ably express the wonder and joy he has known of seeing his ordinary turned into the extraordinary. When God takes our puny gifts, or our money and abilities, or our dreams, or our passion, what happens to them is just out, well, it is out of this world. So he secures them. If we give it to God, it's secure. If we do it ourselves, it's never secure. So Jochebed saw that secure in him. He preserves them, Ruth and Mary's ointment. He multiplies them. Every single one I've mentioned, it's multiplied when God takes it. He empowers them, King David and Dorcas. He grows his kingdom through them. And he makes what we have given so much more than we could imagine. And I, I just want to encourage you, don't think you're too old or too infirm or too young or too unknowing or just, you know, just think, what do, what do I, what can I do? What have I got? And give it to God and he will turn it into something extraordinary. And when we do, you know, I... Um, this morning I gave a, a word of knowledge to someone in the church and she came to me after the meeting and she said that totally confirms something that God's been saying to me this week. And there's a feeling when that happens. It's like, whoa, God's used me for something supernatural. That's supernatural. And I want to encourage you, don't think what you've got is too little. Don't think your guitar is too little. Okay? Don't think what you've got is too little because you don't know. It might take years. It might take years for it to come to something massive. But if we are faithful and we give it totally to God, whatever it is, a bit of money, some gift, ability you've got, cakes, if we give it to the Lord, I can guarantee you, he'll turn it extraordinary one day. God bless you.